Seth Chitwood is our guest today on Messier Mantra. I'm your host, Mike Messier, and Seth is a filmmaker. And uh, to his credit, you're also going back to school, Seth. Welcome to Messier Mantra. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. And I'm really impressed because uh, you've done a lot of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. At a young age, you've uh, done a ton of web series. You've done a ton of short films. And now, uh, rather than kind of resting on those laurels or staying local to the Massachusetts, Rhode Island area, you're in Hollywood, man, and uh, yeah. you're at AFIC, American Film Institute Conservatory. Does it go by AFIC or just AFI usually? I've heard AFIC, I've heard AFI Conservatory, I've heard the American Film Institute Conservatory program, <laughs> <Right>. so <laughs> however you want to say it, it's the same thing, yeah. And your concentration is screenwriting? Screenwriting, yeah. And, um, but before you even got there, you had done a lot of stuff in Massachusetts, in Rhode Island. Yeah, I was here for about seven years just working on different films, uh, web series. I just was always about getting the experience, no matter how how possible that could be. Um, I would write different web series episodes. I would I would do short films. I would, you know, anything possible to get the experience of writing. And let's take a look uh, right off the bat at your screenwriting resume. Uh, not, not resume, uh, real. Yeah. And I'm really impressed by this, and I don't think enough writers do this, writers and directors, give you because you've directed too and produced. Yeah. Yeah. So let's take a look. Some of the stuff on this reel, I think you've uh, directed and produced as well. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything in the reel that you wrote but did not produce or direct? Yeah, I, I worked with Richard Griffin on um, Frankenstein's Wax Museum, and I just wrote that, which was great. So there's a clip in there too. Okay, so let's yeah. check it out right now. Yeah. Let's check out Seth Chitwood's writer's reel right here on Messier Mantra. I can't believe that you don't believe me either after all that we've been Is this through. how you want to die? A liar? I think we're done here. Guard! You want to live your entire life a coward afraid of the world? Huh? Admit who you are. Tell the truth for once! I didn't do it. You're lying. No, I'm not. I know you are. I can see it in your eyes. It's the same look I saw days ago when I... What? From the man I loved. So what was that? What did you see in his eyes? Doubt. All I want to do is change the world. I have this gift. So why shouldn't I use it? You were the love of my life, Liebchen. Right up until the moment when I had to use you as well. But I knew you forgive me. You were so much of a help to me when you were alive. I knew you would be more of a help. Dead. I do not have that much time left in this world. And I will not cut that time down even more because of a patient's death. It's not hate. It's just what I have to do. You're still so young, Fauna. You may think you understand what's going on, but you have much to learn. Until you've seen what I've seen. Fine, so we'll just stop. Thank you. And tomorrow you'll get up early and you'll get dressed and go off to work. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you were laid off. Sarah! I know! I know! Your company went under and tons of people were laid off. Yes! But not everyone. Sarah, I'm not having this company. Dylan, I will say it again. If you had been better, they wouldn't have cut you. You want answers. Christina Elliott's life is full of questions. You don't know me. I know you. You spend your life looking for answers. <clears throat> answers that may never come. Unless you meet someone with them. I have your answers, Elliot. We're back with Seth Chitwood. Seth, uh, <laughs> I really like your uh, writer's reel, and uh, 
I mean, it's just a, a few things pop out. I mean, Natasha's a great actress, and her hair uh, looks mm -hmm. great. I mean, uh, you know, she, she's a cool person, and just yeah. she looks amazing in that uh, uh, s sequence. And uh, some of these um, projects I've been familiar with, um, we'll get into more of them, but in the Bedroom Web series, you worked with so many people. Mm -hmm. and I remember you called me before you started this in the web, in the Bedroom Web series, mm -hmm. and uh, the... Uh, the amount of work that went into that thing and the amount of people involved, I think I was trying to warn you against doing it. Because yeah. <laughs> I was like, man, you're, yeah. <laughs> you're taking on like, and, and just to, to paint the picture, you brought in um, people who maybe hadn't worked together, had, yeah. but you brought in so many different people from the New England film scene and uh, some that maybe didn't get along perfectly, uh, that would, some of these egos might yeah. clash. And I remember, um, thinking, man, this is going to be interesting. And it was. I think ultimately it was successful. Uh, but along that journey, I'm sure you, you learned some life lessons, huh? Yeah, I think I never do anything easy. If anyone knows me, I try and make it as difficult as possible. And I like to stress myself out. And right. and, and, and literally, when, if I'm not having a nervous breakdown, that I'm not doing it right. <laughs> and um, so, the, I mean, that's how some of the web series, they would turn into casts of like 10. And then by the end, they'd be casts of like 67 people. Right. I mean, by the end of my six years here in New England, I'd worked with like 250 actors and I had done 200 web episodes. So I always kind of challenged myself, so whatever the next episode, the next project was, how to make it bigger and better. And so for In the Bedroom, I wanted to do some sort of collaboration and bring in all different filmmakers. And I think that the biggest lesson that I learned was, in which we kind of decided to do halfway through, was make sure it was like, this is your DP, this is how many hours you get, this is the, you get one room, two actors, a six hours, this is the crew, you kind of pull from the same pool, and that's it. And I kind of was, that was the first time that I also was like, you just have to take no for an answer. I was, right. I think a lot of people like to be accommodated, and a lot of people like to try and do things to fit their comfort zone, and I, and I get that, but I kind of learned the lesson of being like, if you're too accommodating, it, nothing will get done. There's a lot of issues. There's a lot of problems that will arise. So I had to be better at just being, no, nope, this is the way it's going to be. And if you don't want to, we'll find somebody else. You had to put your bad cop yeah. hat on. Which And I think people respect you. And, I, and, I, right. and, and in the bedroom, we I brought in nine uh, directors and I think... Uh, and then uh, seven uh, writers, and I think only eight, uh, eight of the nine did their director, and only one director said this is, I didn't want to do it that way, and they, and they walked and we, we found somebody else, so. I had a good time with it. I, I wrote yeah. two pieces and directed one, and a good friend of ours, Audrey Noon, did a great job yeah. with the yeah. two actresses, Natasha being one of them, yeah. and uh, another one, uh, uh, Kathy, Lachey Berenson, if I'm saying her name right, yeah. uh, she's. Uh, I'm working with her again mm, now for the first time. She's very talented. Yeah, yeah, since the five years, and you were such a young guy uh, yeah. at the time, I know. and and still young now, but even five years ago. So yeah. I give you a lot of credit. Now, what could some of the actors that were involved in that uh, process? What life lessons have you learned in Hollywood at American Film Institute that you can kind of share with you know maybe regional actors, whether they're in New mm. England or other parts of the world? You're learning from the very best top screenwriters, people that are writing scripts that have been produced in Hollywood. What can local or regional actors who really want to make it big, what are some nuggets of information you can share with them? I think that when you're in New England, it's about getting the experience to get you to Hollywood, if that's where you want to go, or New York, but right. Hollywood, if you want to go to the professional world. Sure. But I think you need to understand, and, and what I also, it was the same for me when I went to Hollywood, is that what your experience that you have will get you to Hollywood. And then it's just, your, it's a clean slate. That's what got you to Hollywood, and now you're starting over. Right. So, I, you know, when you're on set, we, so at AFI, we got to do three short films as well, because there's a screenwriting program, but there's also a directing program, a producing, uh, editing, cinematography, and production design. And so each student from each of those uh, departments would come together to do these short films. And so we would work with the SAG uh, conservatory program to cast them and work with them in these, in these little short films. And I think that the more successful actors were the ones that understood that, that they're the puppet, basically. Right. And I know an actor hates to be told you're a puppet. Sure. But until you're a brand name and until you're offering more, 
than just your acting to the role. You are essentially the puppet. The director will tell you what to do. You're, you're trusted to come in and be fully memorized. When you're Denzel and, Washington, you can call your own shots. Right. When you're, when you're <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you're Mariska Hargitay on Law and Order SVU right. and you've been on for 20 years, you can become an executive producer and you can have a hand in the writing and you can direct episodes and you can come to the production table. Right. But if you're not being invited to the pre-production and the post-production meetings, your, your job is to come fully memorized and listen to the director and the crew and give the best performance you possibly can. And in Hollywood, which is different from regional, is that there are thousands of actors that are, could do the role just as well as you could. And, and they'll step up if they need to. And if you're not going to bring your 100% A game and be as easy as possible, you will be fired and they will find another actor. It's that brutal. It's that harsh. Same as writing. If you can't bring 100% to the writing, they'll find another writer. It's all about risk factor. And when you're working on these million dollar budget productions, $10 million productions, they don't even want to waste a dollar. Right. So I guess my best advice is to come to LA, to New York, and expect to just show up do what you need to do and let everyone you know, tell you what to do. And then once you've raised out of that and become a brand name and get a following, then you might be able to add a, your two cents to the collaboration. But you know, there was nothing worse than working at AFI. We'd work two months in pre-production to collaborate, and then we'd bring the actors in. And not all the time, but there'd be like one or two occasional actors that would get back to us that would, you know, want to put their two cents in or want to suggest an, an angle, or they'd be unhappy that they're doing the left side right. of their face. But what they don't understand is we spent a month and a half talking about why we want the left side of the face because it matches another cut later, or it's something that makes sense to the narrative. And when you have an actor that says, "I don't want you to shoot the left side of me." You kind of want to be like, then let's get another actor who will. Yeah, let's get an and, actor who's got two and good here, sides. here, you might get away with it because there might only be like four or five actors that might be available to come in right. at the last second and step into a role. But in in, uh, in LA, you could you could call the the SAG conservatory rep and be like, "Hi, we're having an issue with this actor. Can you get us someone?" And they could get us someone by the end of the day. It Is was there pretty any crazy. Feeling in Los Angeles, Seth, um, of any type of I don't want to say. Uh, fear or concern about smaller markets with tax credits taking away from the Hollywood scene? Is that a consideration or is that not even something they worry about at all? Or is somewhere in between? Well, I think that now film and television especially is, this, is huge and everyone's doing it. So right. it's going all over the place. So they're outsourcing to smaller places or they're or they're even hiring local production companies, putting some money behind them, saying, you go out, you produce it, you film it, and then we'll, we'll buy it back. Netflix has been doing that model now recently. So I guess it's, it's a mix to yeah. your question. But there's jobs everywhere. I mean, there's jobs for writers. There's, oh, they're always looking for writers, which is really great. Um, I mean, one thing I learned at AFI and also in Hollywood is that we're in an age of cultural appropriation which is that they want only you know, a man to write a man's story, a woman to write a woman's mm. story. And which is fine, I, I, they're, and they're, we're growing in the numbers of more female directors and, and writers, which I think is amazing. We need more voices like that in our narrative, and we shouldn't be doing the same story over and over again, you know, sure. not making the sixth Psycho movie, or they're doing right. Child's Play again. Like, we want new stories, and bringing in women and diversity and, and international, you know, writers is amazing, and it's really great. But for me, like, I had done a lot of web series where I was writing female protagonists. Yes. Family Problems, Natasha, Wendy Hartman, Karen Martino, they were all these leading ladies that would kind of drive the narrative. And when I went to AFI, I said, that's what I, I want to do. And, and, and they had said to me, they said, when you first start out as a writer in Hollywood, you want to only do what's you know, close to home that only you can do and no one else can do. Mm. They talk a lot about uh, Damien Chazelle, who did Whiplash and La La Land. Right. And Whiplash was based off of you know, his experience with uh, being at NYU, I believe, and, and being a musician. The and drum having, student yeah, film, and, the guy, and, the Miles Teller, right. and uh, Academy Award Best Supporting Actor. Right, and uh, that was based off of his life. Right. And so he came and said, I'm the only one who can direct this, and I'm the only one who can write this because I know this from the back of my hand. This is my life. Right. And La La Land was very similar as well. And, and then now just recently he directed First Man, which was the first kind of project that was a biopic that wasn't close to home. I mean, he had his own personal connections, but it was the first time that he had already proven, again, this risk factor 
where you have to prove to studios when there's money involved that I'm the best candidate. And when you say, oh, I've gone to film school, oh, I have all these projects, oh, I have an Oscar nomination for Whiplash, you know, it decreases the risk. So when they put you in something that's not something so close to you, uh, the risk is a little bit less. Mm. But going back to the culture appropriation point was that for me, they said that I'd be better off writing, you know, I'm an openly gay man, so I wanted to write more, you know, stuff about being a, a struggling gay man, someone who, you know, deal, dealt a lot with it in high school, has dealt a lot of, with, with relationships and trying to lose weight, and so uh, writing those kind of stories. Mm. Or when I was young, when I was 13, I was uh, diagnosed with something called Steven Johnson syndrome, and basically it's an illness where uh, you're, it's an allergic reaction to a medication. Oh. And I was in the hospital for a month, and what happens is your body has these lesions that form inside and outside of your body. Oh, geez. And while I was there, my left lung had also collapsed. Oh. And it was a whole ordeal for me and my family, but that's the story that they want because you know there's not a lot of people that have that experience. It's very specific. It's, there's yeah. a survival, right. and people can relate to... Even if they didn't have your exact condition, everyone's been in the hospital for the right. most part with something that scared the hell out of them mm -hmm. and had to survive. Oh, keep right. going, yes. And I was going to say that I think that you want, everyone has a story to tell. Everyone, you know, right. you you just sit down and have a coffee with someone, and someone will tell you a story. And what they really teach us at AFI, which has really you know stayed with me, is that is is yeah, there's a story, but how do you put this narrative on it that will interest millions of people and for my story about Stephen Johnson syndrome like that's an interesting story but there needed to be this character arc this narrative that was added to it that makes it you know more inspirational and I was writing for my first year a feature about my father it was a journalist he was a television critic and uh, he had written for the Providence Journal for several years and uh, this is not the character is similar based on my father but this was a different character who had would always was kind of a workaholic was was stuck in in his work right and so when his son is diagnosed with this illness he has to choose family over over getting the next story following the next lead at work and so it was a story about Stephen Johnson syndrome and about a family going through a crisis of this illness but also the main protagonist was this father who had to step away from the news to try and take care of his family but he was so stuck on wanting to like you know any day that he can't be writing a story is, is, a, is a missed story. Pencil behind his ear and right. his cap and yeah. everything. Yeah, so it was, it was that kind of struggle between putting family first over career. And so that was the story I kind of set out to write for my first year. And uh, so, I, so they want you to write stories that only you can tell. And then as you prove yourself as a writer in Hollywood, then you can go out and be like, you know, uh, I would. I want to. I'll give one more really quick example. Uh, Shonda Rhimes, for example. She, oh yes, Scandal. Right, Scandal, Grey's Anatomy, How to Get Away with Murder. Her first film was The Princess Diaries Two. Okay. And she was very successful with that movie, and it was for Disney. And ABC said, you know, what do you have next? What's in, you know, what's in your can? And she said, well, I have this pilot about a bunch of interns that work in a hospital, and uh, she went off and she wrote Grey's Anatomy, and. Uh, the she has said that she originally wanted to have an African American lead as Meredith Grey, but right. in the time where she started, she said, "I know how Hollywood is, and it's all about risk, and they're not going to get behind a, a, an African American leading lady in 2004." And so she sat down and did Grey's Anatomy, and when it was winning all these Emmy awards and it was you know the highest watched uh, drama on ABC, three four years in a row, they said, okay, what else do you have? And she said, I have Scandal, and she put Kerry Washington as the as the lead, and she finally proved that I have a model that worked, and right. you can trust me, and I have a brand. Shondaland is a huge success, and now I'm going to do what I've always wanted to do. So with that idea. It's been interesting to tell the story that only I can tell, and then once I prove myself in Hollywood or, or you know, make a movie or sell a script, and they're like, okay, what else you got? Then I could be like, well, I have this female protagonist lead that's you know not completely relatable, but is a story I've always wanted to tell, and, and they're a little bit more prone to wanting to tell that story. Strong, sexy, and in the political fires of uh, Washington, D.C., yeah. involving the president, his right. wife, and... Uh, I got into Scandal and Grey's Anatomy because I took uh, Shonda Rhimes' masterclass yeah. on the masterclass.com website. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just hadn't really been exposed to either show, and I got really hooked, especially in Scandal, 
mostly because of Kerry Washington. Mm. What a fire, right. uh, flaming light of acting. What right. a brilliant actress. And then we went on to do How to, How to Get Away with Murder with Rhode Island's Viola Davis, who won an Emmy. And I mean, she's Shonda Rhimes. I, Shonda Rhimes and Ryan Murphy are two of my favorite kind of writers, as well as John August, and um, a little bit of Darren Aronofsky as well. That's the kind of stuff I, I like to write. So. If I ever get the chance to be in a room with them someday, that would be yeah. a dream come true. That's that's the goal is to is to write with with that team. Well, I wrote a script uh, uh, to fight or play basketball that I'd love to get to uh, Kerry Washington as lead. Now I want to mm. take a break from the conversation. If we can look at the still photos, uh, thanks to Cody and Kevin in the studio, we have some still photos from your career, and mm. uh, we'll get those going here. And uh, here is AFI Conservatory. That's the logo of where you're at. Mm -hmm. And uh, very cool, very nice logo. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I love this, man. I went to, uh, I don't know if it was 2016 or 15 I went to, but I went to an Angelwood Pictures Angel Awards. You're the only guy I know who made so many web series and so many. You had an award ceremony. It was actually pretty fun yeah. for your own stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so you won every award, but you had different <laughs> actors. And I actually, I guess I was upset. Oh. I got nominated for award. I didn't even win. Oh, but I know sorry. for a writing award, but this yeah. is okay. I it, didn't, I didn't <laughs> win all of them, but I, I wanted to do something to give back to the actors. And we had had like so many shows that we could compete against. So it was a it was, fun, fun night. I think yeah. we might have some more uh, photos in there. We'll just bang these out. Here's the Angelwood uh, Pictures logo. Uh, I like that halo with the tree. That's cool. I dig that. Uh, who's this gentleman? This is David Affleck, and he's uh, in uh, Girl in the Attic, which is one of my series. Yep. Very, ta very pe talented. People can find these. Is it angelwoodpictures.com? Yep. Okay. All of the shows are there, angelwoodpictures.com. Family Problems. Is this uh, yeah. Pete? Uh, That's Peter Morse. It's no longer on on Sundays, the show. We did four seasons, 70 episodes, and it ended about two years ago. But it started with this family, and... And it was kind of my first kind of full professional web series with adult actors, and it, it just it, it won uh, 16 awards. It was it was a really great experience. Our mutual friend uh, Christy Devine watches Family Problems. I think she's seen every episode at least oh. once, maybe twice. Oh, that's nice. Now this next one in the bedroom web series. We'll take a look at this uh, photo. Uh, here's uh, our friend uh, Kathy uh, in the middle left. Uh, she was uh, in a piece that I wrote but did not direct. Audrey Noon directed. Beneath her on the far left is Lanisha Edmonds. That's the episode yeah. I wrote and directed. All these people are great. J.P. Valenti is now in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, the lady in the middle uh, has done great things. Maria, yeah, Maria I believe. Not, Maria Nadapov, yeah. Yep. And uh, Kate Carson on the upper right. She's and, in L.A., yeah. And beneath her is a, is a friend of mine. What's her name again? Uh, Ellen Levins. That's right. It's Ellen. Yes, Ellen's awesome. And, uh, That's an all-star picture right there. It Those really are, is. And Charlie. For, oh, there. I didn't even see Charlie Thacker. Yeah, Charlie's up there. Who's like 35 years old now. Yeah, right. <laughs> like Charlie no, was the, but... the kid actor. If you needed a kid actor, you called Charlie. But he's probably uh, pushing, uh, now he's a teenage, I'm he's sure. Teenager. And there's even people that were in that cast that's not even on that photo that are super talented, like Wendy Hartman, um, Jose Gonzalez. Oh, yes. Um, David was in that, Monica Savilakis. There's so many people in that cast, 16 actors that were just so talented. Who's the young guy next to Lanisha there with the mustache? Um, that was Joe Plouffe. Okay, Joe, yeah. yeah. And let's go to the next one. Here we go. That's Karen Martino in Family Problems. And very, she, she won a, a LA uh, Web Fest Award for Supporting Actress in a drama series, and uh, she, I mean, she became that role. It was uh, Mother Turner was the character. She, she uh, doesn't look anything like that outside of the character. No, no, not at all. She's a very glamorous woman. So oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's that, but when she played that, we, I didn't want any makeup for that character. Oh, yeah. I wanted it to be very, like a scary nun, and she, and she pulled it off really well. Yeah, Karen's great. Wow, yeah, this she, she really got into character because she looks nothing like this no, in real life. No, if you met Karen in real life, you'd be like, oh, oh my God, she's completely different. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's uh, Lungs, the web series. Yeah, that was with also Ellen Levinson, who you can't see her face, but that was from the poster with the with the curls in her hair. Yep. And Paul Kandarian, who's also an incredibly talented yeah, actor. Yeah, Paul's really good. And this is Kimberly May, who led the show for two seasons, then we switched to another actress for the last two seasons, yep. which was... An experience in itself as well. Well, who's this person? This is this Pam, is Pamela Jane Morgan. 
Oh yeah. And uh, she's in. This is a, a photo I didn't from the girl. Her either with her hair. Yeah, the back. girl in the attic as well. This was a dream sequence. We kind of made her look a little villainy, but she's a uh, she's a very talented actress. She just uh, had a uh, an appearance on Law and Order SVU. You know, Pam, Pamela's yeah. uh, was in uh, The Manor. Which yeah. I co-wrote too. Yeah. Testing. Yep. That was uh, one of the series that's still airing now, and it's just about to finish. So. Nice. Girl in the Attic. Yeah. This might be my favorite. Uh, this is very haunting. How's the young lady doing? Did she survive uh, with her mental? Is she okay? <laughs> in other words, sometimes <laughs> these kid actors in horror films, I worry about them. Is yeah, she all right? Oh, she's fantastic. Yeah. Alexa Harmon, very talented. She's Wendy Harmon's daughter. There you go. Yeah. And this is also Tanya oh, yeah. Lynch. Tanya Lynch. Catherine Shasha behind her. I, I've, got, I've had the pleasure of working with some amazing actors. And Tanya, who's now doing more producing, but she's also, I mean, I had such a great time working with her on this production. It was, it was really fun. Tanya's great. Catherine's doing a um, movie of her own now. She's doing yeah. a documentary, very important, yeah. Yeah. on oh, IED. This is Tony Ramos Wright, who plays Father Hamblin in, in Family Problems, season four and five. And, Tony Wright is, is an incredible actor. I, you know, one of one of the top actors I've I've had the pleasure of working with, and he's he's goes so far. He pops up in everything, so I'm sure he's a familiar face. But this was a really fun character to collaborate on for a year, and he did such a such an incredible job. Did you take the photos, or did you have a photographer? Or? I have a photographer, but I actually did take that photo, okay. and, I, and I edited it because I wanted to have this halo, and I wanted to have these like dark wings coming off of it because he played this priest that was having kind of a crisis of faith and then he decides to use the bible to kind of create a cult in right. a way and so he kind of has a bunch of people do violent acts for him and it was kind of it, it, to see that evolution from a character who uh had this crisis because someone he loved dies and it just turns him upside down and he hates god and so it was such it was such a fun character to write and for me because I'm, I'm jewish and right. i was writing this incredibly like <laughs> christian catholic blah, like horror piece but it was it, having tony on board was he he kept me in check he, he became the character i wanted and, and more uh he even got to a there's a really funny story and it's and i think it's a it's a great lesson on you know, let, you know, it's great. I said earlier, actors are the puppets, but sometimes when you're working with your leads, they might come to you and say, you know, this line doesn't really work or this, or, or you right. know, I, I just like, I, and it wasn't like a demand. It's more, it's great when you have a relationship where you're able to know that someone is so fully in it. And, and you'll know the difference when you have the experience I have, you'll know when an actor is 100% fully committed and when an actor is just showing up and doing the lines. You can, you can tell. Calling it in, so to speak. And so you are more prone to want to accommodate with actors who are, are like, I'm right there, right next to you on, right. the, on, the, on the racetrack. And then actors who like are all the way back at the start line, checking sure. their watch, not realizing that the, that the trigger was pulled to go. And yeah. then they try to you know, tell you how they want to do your film. And you're kind of like, do you even know... Have you even read the full script? Right. But you know, Tony was, he was so fully in it. And uh, I had written this allegory monologue about these animals, this dream about animals that all gain together to take down the lion. And uh, he came to me and he said, this is so stupid. And I was so in it and I thought, no, it's great. It's a great you know, dream sequence about you getting fear that your congregation is going to bring you down. And he's like, it's really on the nose and it's really kind of mm. funny and it's a little laughable. And so uh, it, it was great to get a different perspective for a second. And uh, I, I fought him for a second, but then I took a, I, call, I think I called him the next day and I said, okay, we'll, we'll cut the monologue. Interesting. And, uh, and I know it wasn't because he didn't want to do a monologue because he had done so many monologues on the show and he was so talented. But I look back and we make a joke. Uh, every so often I'll be messaging with him and I'll be like, I'll be like remember that animal monologue? <laughs> so, not I want my, to force you to do it on stage yeah, in Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of what you just said. It reminds me of uh, Sylvester Stallone was given the script for Rambo. Mm -hmm. And he said, we got to take the dialogue out. Rambo would mm -hmm. not be talking this much. Right. And, uh, you know, it very, it's interesting to hear an actor say your story or the Stallone story, which is, I need less lines. Right. This character doesn't want to speak that much. Well, they teach us at AFI, and I, I had kind of known this, but, I, you know, when you're doing very low-budget stuff, having talking scenes are easier. Right. Because it's... You can have you can sit down, two people, get the camera angles, and we'll just talk. And, sure. and you can talk plot and exposition. 
And people want more action. They want to see stuff going on. They always tell us when you're writing scenes, you know, give the actor something to do. Are they folding laundry? Are they making Business, pasta? Yeah. You know, what are they doing with their hands? Like, because no one, after a while, gets kind of bored watching just two people talking. So I don't know how many people are watching this, but <laughs> but um, no, I think they always want you know there to not just be two heads. So I think that. Uh, when when you start to write more and more, when you can cut exposition, you can cut talking and 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 have more action and show more of the narrative through uh, visuals and less talking. It's more powerful. Right. And so I have really tried over the last, especially the last year and a half, to really reteach myself to write more visual action than just dialogue. I remember seeing the first uh, ten pages or so of the. Uh script, uh, won the Academy Award for Best Picture, um, the kids, Indian kids on the game show. Mm. And you know what I'm talking about? I, won, won the Best Picture. Yeah. Uh, I, and it's like... A, oh, it's, a Slumdog Millionaire. Thank you. Yeah. Slumdog Millionaire. And it's just very thick paragraphs of yeah. descriptive action. And I'm looking at this, and the movie had already won Best Picture by the time I'm looking at the script. I'm thinking... Mm. If I was a, putting myself in the position of a Hollywood producer, I would uh, this would drive me nuts. Right. But that's what won the Academy Award because yeah. that's what that visual uh, storytelling. Right. And uh, I think it's great that you're uh, sharing some of these lessons. I want to take a look yeah. at your trailer though. For uh, uh, I think it's the Girl in the Attic trailer, mm -hmm. and you send me a lot of stuff. And people, if they go to AngelwoodPictures.com. They can see this. They can see the web series. I think it's. I think they're free, uh, or or do you they're have to pay a price? Free yeah. So it's just. Yeah. I think well, let's take a look at the trailer because I want to see more of your work. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at the girl in the attic uh, trailer from Seth Chitwood. to ask you earlier, uh, that's very haunting, uh, first of all, but I wanted to ask you earlier, before I forget, um, how is the status of that screenplay you were describing about uh, the father, the son, the illness, how is that coming along? Still writing it. Okay. And uh, you, when you, I think the best screenplays are the ones that are written 45 times, for different right. versions. Right, and right. So I'm on like version nine and I'm still kind of figuring out, well, we workshopped it in, at AFI and, and now I, I had to kind of put it in a drawer for a month. Sure. And you, you should always put stuff in a drawer for a month and take a deep breath and not think about it and then come back to it because new eyes are always, you know, the best way to handle a script because it, it was a monster of a, of a script. There were so many directions to go in and I, I like some parts and some parts I, I think are weak and I have to kind of build on and, and uh, I don't want to be so procedural and, and for me it was definitely a story about my hospital experience as well and so it was hard to kind of let some of the true facts go and, right. and, and make it more of a, a Hollywood narrative or the, or the more of a fictional piece. But it's, it's going well, and I hope to use it, and I hope it will be a portfolio piece in the, in the near future, but we'll, we'll see. But right now it's sitting in the, in the, in the uh, drawer. What is that term, portfolio piece? Well, 
not only AFI, so a the program that I'm in right now, we're trying to do a, a portfolio which will have two features and one to two television pilots in it. Okay. And that's the requirement. And then we'll use that portfolio that you want to pitch out to managers and agents and uh, uh, showrunners and uh, producers and anyone who might be interested. But having your own kind of portfolio of your best work, you should always have in the back of your mind. Because, you, you know, when, when people ask you, you know, what do you have? You should be able to say, oh, I have this uh, amazing feature about a kid in the hospital and a, and a workaholic father. It's done, it's, and I can send you the PDF right now. Right. And then you throw them over an NDA and you send it to them, and, and uh, that's how you'll be surprised how many people will ask you, what do you have? And if you can send them right, something right there. You want so those having, tools in your tool shed, right, toolbox. And, and the best advice that I got, because I, I love writing, so I write a lot and I have so many ideas. It's like always turning sure. and turning in my head. Um, I was told just write, 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 and have a lot of different projects because you'll reach a time in your career where getting content out and having six or seven completed scripts and pilots, uh, features and pilots, it will be very helpful. Right. So I try and, you know, if you want to be a real serious writer, my best advice is just to do four hours of writing every day. Sure. Just get into that strict habit of, of constantly writing either the feature that you've been writing for a year or something new or just some scenes that you think could pop up in something along the way. I'll have some ideas that'll, come, that'll stem from like a, a scene. Like Girl in the Attic came from this idea of, I actually I, had a, I kept having a dream about walking into my parents' room and this woman in all black, black hair, that creepy woman that you saw that's played by Marty Smith, who no one really knows because oh. she's so unrecognizable. I didn't but recognize she her as that. So wow. Well. Um, I kept having this dream of this woman just sitting on the, the king-size bed in my parents' room and staring back at me, and then I'd wake up from that dream. And I was like, oh, I, you know, maybe I have to write this somehow. So I kept writing that scene, and then I, I, I started having these like visions of just this scene of this girl that was stuck in an attic. And so I just wrote a bunch of just different attic scenes that this girl was trying to get out of. And then I started to add more characters. Okay, maybe these are different dreams by different characters. Mm. And then I came up with this concept. What if six people were having the same dream about a girl, but different details, different kinds of dreams that all revolving around a girl stuck in an attic, and then they eventually meet up and they compare their dream stories together, and it kind of gives them clues as to maybe this girl is, is real, or maybe we have to help this girl, or maybe there's something more here. And they eventually find out she's a real girl who was trapped in an attic, and they have, they they have to save her. Wow, yeah, it's it's intense. Uh, and uh, just to unpack some of that stuff you said, because there's a lot. But putting the script away for 30 days at least is that something you learned at the school? Was that your own choice? Was that a lesson from one of the teachers? Uh, one of my professors did say, take this, put it in a drawer, and don't think about it. But I had, you know, there's a lot of projects where you'll be writing, and you'll get to, like, the midpoint, and you'll kind of be like, oh, do I want to, can I, can I, I can't get further. Right. I'm, like, I'm stuck. And the worst thing you do is stare at a blank screen. Oh, yeah. So I'll put it away, and then I won't think about it for three or four weeks, and then I'll come back to it. And it'll just always be in my mind. I'll be driving, or I'll be taking a shower, or I'll just be like, you know, waiting for something, and I'll just be like thinking about it. And then I'll go back and try and add stuff to it, or I'll write down. I, I do a lot of journaling, so I'll write down a lot of notes about the different projects and, and, and things that could help move the story along, or rewrite it and change it. Or I've had, I mean, Family Problems was changed so many times, and I, I had had like originally that it was going to be about. This uh, like the the son was gonna die, but then it, and the murder mystery was gonna be around a son, and then I changed it to a daughter, and then there was a whole there was gonna be plot lines about about maybe she was pregnant and did she have the child or right. not, and then I cut that. So I mean, when you're writing, there's so much has evolved, and and uh, and some of I look at some of my work and I'm always like. Uh, it's, uh, the actors will always find it funny because we'll be sitting around waiting for a shot to be set up and, and we'll just randomly be talking and I'll say, oh, you know, your character is supposed to die in season one, but <laughs> I liked you, so I kept you to season four. Playing God. With yeah. The, the <laughs> yeah. It's interesting how, uh, and I, I can totally see this, that the regional scene of New England, it could be mm. any regional scene. It could be right. people in Tacoma, Washington, yeah. uh, wherever, but how that is going to differ from more or less the big leagues of Hollywood. And, and yeah. still, and 
you know, we have a, a friendly uh, Facebook group, Hollywood East Actors Group, by our good friend Erica Derrickson. But even she told me that sometimes that name of Hollywood East is kind of a misnomer because it's really not. It's its own animal, New England. Yeah. It's its own thing. And you can't really take the rules that work here or the networking yeah. or the uh, me familia or the clickiness. You can't really take that and put that, that set of rules yeah. to New York City to Hollywood, to Chicago, or even to Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, you have to kind of know the market. And what I think is exciting as a young guy, uh, Seth, you have this opportunity that you've kind of created your own world to the mm -hmm. point of having your own award show. Mm -hmm. But now you're, like you said, clean slate. You're here with your uh, classmates, which are mm -hmm. your colleagues. In a sense, they're your competitors too. And you kind of have to see how you do on that realm. I, I think that how you've been saying all these different regional film worlds, they're all different little bubbles. Right. And I think people do get stuck in that bubble, and you kind of keep going around the same circles of the same people and the same audiences, and it just really stays in this circle, this bubble. And then you go off to Hollywood or even New York, but I'm, we'll just talk about Hollywood, which is this huge bubble. But it's right. completely, it is a bubble. It still only stays within them, mm. and very hardly does it reconnect to the little bubble you came from. For me, I stayed in New England for almost six, almost seven years, and I, that was a little bit too long for me. Um, the biggest lesson I think that I have, I'm telling, especially actors who say, oh, I'm thinking about moving to LA, or, or I don't know when I should go, and I'm like, I think that you should get the, the few lead projects that you can, get the experience, but you should stay here no more than two or three years, and then go to LA or New York if you want to be a professional actor. Right. And the ones that are staying here for, Eight, nine, ten years. I don't want to. I don't want to discourage those actors because those are good actors as well, and, and they're and they're very talented. And sometimes they also, you know, can't be full time actors. They, they, have, they, family, have, they have family commitments, they have whatever. Commitments. But I think yeah. that when you're here for a long time, you have to accept that you're. It's kind of becoming a hobby, and you're right. kind of a hobbyist in this bubble. And you might be the top of your game in this bubble, and that's really great. And I'm super proud of you to make it there. But I think people have to remember that. New England is its own bubble, and if and it's not as professional as it is in Hollywood. It, it plays by its own games, it plays by its own rules, and I just want to say that if you ever decide after staying here for so long and getting the experience that you got, that you want to go to the next big bubble, remember that it's always going to be a clean slate, no matter what you do. Mm. I mean, I mean, if you make it, if a Hollywood production comes here and makes you the lead, then great, but that's in the Hollywood bubble. But even if you were in all of the all of the films and you were leading every single one of them, and if you were even the leads in my stuff, and you then tried to go to L.A. and think that you were lead material and that you ha that you were this all star, you will fall flat on your face. And and for me, I had to check my you know ego sure. and my talent at the door. I, I was like, Hollywood's a new world. AFI is a new world. I, I don't regret all the stuff that I did, all the projects that I worked on. They got me the experience that got me to AFI, but now I'm at AFI, and now AFI is going to reprogram me and get me prepared for the big bubble of Hollywood. The one thing I, I guess, I, uh, two things I found about your particular schooling is, uh, A, um, that your screenplay is more so based on the father character than the actual kid going through the illness, which I find to be an interesting choice. Um, maybe it's the age of the kid is so young that he hasn't had a lot of life experience and the father is more in the crisis. Do yeah. I sacrifice my you know, beat reporter status, I'm the man who tells the story, tells the people the truth, and you know, however he's coming at life and put that on hold for a little while or prioritize my son's health above that. Yeah. And maybe, uh, I'm not sure the age of the character in the script, if he's 13, 12, 11, or, mm -hmm. or older, but maybe that's just he doesn't have enough life experience to warrant being the lead of the feature script. So I found that to be an yeah. interesting choice. And it's, I'm mean, going back with that script because a plot that I had written in the first draft that now I cut from the other draft was, does he use his research skills to go out and try and, because Stephen Johnson syndrome had no cure, and, and still does it. Basically, they give you a lot of morphine, and they give you around-the-clock care, and you just... It can go on as long as it, it does, and you just kind of have to hope, and it's a 20% survival rate, and now it's gone a little bit better, but this was 2003, so, you know, it was just kind of waited out. And so I originally had written uh, an arc where the character was 
who's like leaves the hospital, goes out, tries to get answers to how this could have happened, and tries to find something that the doctors couldn't find. And when he comes up empty-handed and has to go back to his family and say, I tried really hard, but I didn't find anything, he learns the biggest lesson, which was, we didn't want you to do that. We, your son just wanted you by the bedside holding his hand. That's all he wanted. And you didn't do that. Mm. And, and, and that's what kind of helped, that's the climax for the character where he realizes they just want me to be a dad, not a reporter. Right. So that's like been a plot that I've been kind of figuring out of how it could work. But it, it's, writing is hard. Yeah, it is. <laughs> People it, don't tell you that. It, it's hard. No. They, they, I love it, but it's, it's hard. It is. Uh, and yeah. and th th that, that reminds me of what you just said of, of the male complex of always got to figure out the problem. Mm. And women will complain yeah. that men, oftentimes in relationships, always want to fix things. Right. And this guy, you're not supposed to fix it. You're not the doctor. We got that covered. Right. You have to be dad. And maybe that's something, for whatever reason, he's emotionally blocked. Yeah. The second thing I wanted to talk about uh, was, maybe I would disagree with this notion, but that's what you learned. And that's why I'm kind of fascinated by it, is that you... Uh, were encouraged to write more about yourself and sacrifice mm -hmm. some of your great female characters for a mm -hmm. while, at least. Yeah. And maybe the idea was get yourself established with this personal story, get that out of your system. Hadn't even apparently hadn't even occurred to you to write that story mm -hmm. until you were encouraged by the staff or the teachers or the yeah. professors. And I, I just I hope that you don't uh, sacrifice your wonderful uh, talents for writing female characters because, like you said. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Natashas, the Wendy's, you know, all these ladies that did great work with you here and the actresses that you will eventually meet in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, they want to have those type of juicy characters, yeah. whether they're written by a man or a woman, I would say. So yeah. I, ho I hope that you get back to those characters. Yeah, I, I think I will. I think, like I said, it's all about risk factor and they want to go with, you know, who are you? Oh, you're the, the you're pulling from your own experiences. So they, they'll trust that more to be a successful screenplay than something that's completely out in left field or out of the box right. when you're first starting. But, you know, I don't regret the, the projects that I did here in New England. I, I'm, I wrote 70 episodes of the Elliot and Ellison storyline for Family Problems. And uh, I just recently uh, saw Karen Ann Martino, uh, and she said, you know, don't forget, you, you wrote these amazing characters, these amazing series, you won awards, you, you had these great followings, so you were doing something right. Yeah. And art and writing is all subjective, it's all different perspectives. Even at AFI, I, I love the, the program, it's an incredible program, and the staff, like, you're working with actual working writers who give you these incredible advice because they're they're in the middle of it right and uh, one professor I, I really love she wrote a walk to remember she wrote a dolphin tale and uh, I mean she the advice that she'd give me were just I would like hang on every word that she would say and uh, uh, but she would say one thing and then another staff member would right. contradict her in another class right. and then he would say something and then she'd contradict him and there's nothing wrong with that it just shows that there's there's all different perspectives about writing and about art art is very subjective and uh, they're only telling us what could work maybe in uh, Hollywood, what they're looking for now, and what they're, they're want, they want stories and the stories that only you can tell. Right. And that's what they're investing in right now. And then once you've proven yourself, then you can kind of go a little more out of the box. But I, I, I have so many stories I want to tell. And, and I think that's what, uh, that's why I love being a writer is that I, I have a journal of like, you know, 45 log lines of different features and, and pilots that I'd love to write. And so I, I'm, sh I'm sure one day I will come across that person that says, let me see your journal, and hopefully they'll invest in all of them. <laughs> I think we've got just enough time yeah. to show an episode of In the Bedroom web series that you wrote and directed. What's yep. the title of this episode? It was called uh, uh, The Snoring Future. It okay. starred Sean McPherson and Charlie Tacker. This was 2014, but I've been very proud of this episode. And it's basically about a son who has to put up with his father's snoring at grandma's house. Let's check it out right here on Messier Mantra.
This is my father. Yep, this long sounding freight train is my daddy. Why am I sleeping next to him? Well, this happens every time we come to Grandma's house. I have to share with them, with him. You know what that means, do ya? Spend the whole day getting my cheeks pinched and feeling like they're about to be pulled off by Grandma. And all night listening to the sounds of the Civil War. How can someone snore like that? Is he part animal? The sounds he's making. Oh, wait. R for this. Ready? Ready? Watch this. Dad, Dad, stop snoring! No, no, she's so. I want to tell him on her. Oh, okay. A parade could come to this room and he wouldn't respond. That idiot. I can't believe I'm forced to sleep like this. It's inhumane. All the sound can't be. Ah! Are you kidding me? No! Oh god! Did he. It smells like. I can't. I'm going to die. I see the light. This is it. Goodbye, world. Thanks for having me. I can't breathe anymore. <laughs> no. He won't defeat me. I'll take him with me. To complete this game. <laughs> take this! <laughs> I think we're not talking about this. Is, is that going to be me in 20 years? Will I, I become that man? Am I going to be lying next to my son making sounds like an exploding lawnmower? It's smelling like a McDonald's restroom when my son is swearing in his head and plotting which ways to kill me? Is this what my future holds? I'm so sorry, Dad. I wasn't thinking. You were a boy once. You must have had this experience, too. Here I am judging how you sleep. I know if Grandma had another bedroom, I would be in it. I'm really... <coughs> That's it! Kyle, what the heck? Sorry, Dad. <sighs> what were you doing? I don't know. I know. You want to be back in your own bed. I get it. We're going home tomorrow. Okay? Okay. Alright. What's that smell? What smell? <laughs> what smell? I'll tell you what that smell is, you stupid piece of... No. I'm okay. Just take a deep breath, Kyle. Just get through the night. Maybe you can fall asleep before him. And then you'll just wake up tomorrow and... Damn it! I hate my future.
Seth Chidwood, it's like these names are like, this is your life, Seth yeah. Chidwood. <laughs> yeah. We get about 30 seconds. Uh, give us a quick mantra before we end. I was, I've been thinking about it. I, I love the quote, uh, how do you get to Carnegie Hall, which was practice, practice, practice. So I feel like for me, it's always been how to get to Hollywood, experience, experience, experience. I dig it. Well, yeah. Seth, you're on your way, man. I have uh, big uh, expectations that you're going to nail this thing. You're going to be a top uh, feature film writer, uh, TV series, whatever you want to do. Uh, the world is your oyster, so eat that up. Oh. Thank Seth you Chitwood. so much. Thank you. Thanks for watching this episode of Messier Mantra.